everybody, I'm Tom Vassell, and welcome to Board Game Breakfast, a show about board games and the people who play them. we got lots of things for you today, but I have a couple announcements. First of all, a week from tomorrow, the October 8th, Dice Tower East registration is going to go live. Dice Tower East is a com- really kind of a new thing that we're doing next July. It's kind of a continuation of Dice Tower Con, but there's going to be some changes and things are going to be changed. One of the cool things is the Dice Tower Library that you've seen me working on, that you've seen me talk about each board game breakfast will be there. I'm working on getting a Q&A about the con scheduled for next Monday. Uh, of course, in Q&As between then and here, if you have questions about it, feel free to ask. There's a Facebook group for it, too. Dice Tower West registration is still open, too, and that's actually not too far away. Very excited about that. And Essen is around the corner, so we'll have our announcements. We're going to be at Essen. We'll have a booth there and a, something else that we're going to be doing there that I think people will have a lot of fun with. So that will be announced probably next board game breakfast. Uh, we Secondly, we have a contest going on, Catacomb Cubes. Uh, we, we had a contest for that about a month ago. We're going to re- put that contest back into place because the uh, Catacombs Cubes is being relaunched. This game about building towns using cubes and such. Uh, This contest is starting, well, today and it's going to end October 7th, so one week from today, and we'll announce the winners on our website. There's going to be two drawings and the winners will get a full pledge of Catacomb Cubes, including the playmat for prizes. The question is simple. What Catacombs hero does not appear in Catacombs Cubes? Look in the description of this video and we'll have a listing and pick one of those. Send it to contest at dicetower.com. Alrighty, well let's get the things I found on the internet. Okay, so first of all, Isaac Childress, the designer of Gloomhaven, announced some upcoming stuff for that. Well, actually, he announced announcements, right? He said at Shucks, uh, he's going to be announcing a side project and talking about it there to Gloomhaven. And at a convention in December, he'll be talking about the big box expansion for Gloomhaven. Uh, speaking of Shucks, Shut Up and Sit Down has reached 200,000 subscribers, so congratulations to them. I found this very interesting video, 12 Tone, it's called, the channel's called The Dice Game That Conquered 18th Century Europe. It's music, it's dice, and it's very cerebral, uh, very, I've never seen anything like it, go check it out. Snackable Games uh, is a blog that talked about how to purchase rare and out-of-print board games. How do I find this game? I can't find it anywhere. Well, here are some tips on how you can better find those games. Board Game Geek Mechanisms, there's an update article on that where both Aldi and Jeff Engelstein, who had a lot to do with putting this in place, talk about changes that they're doing to make it more user-friendly, and the whole thing seems to be headed in a pretty cool direction. I mentioned this last week, saying that the codes I wasn't a real big fan of, they took those out, and I'm really excited to see where this is going to lead. On Reddit, I found a thread where someone has made Spotify playlists for different board games. You're playing a board game? Here's a playlist of music for you to listen to. I'm sure there will be countless arguments over whether the music's appropriate for that particular game or not, but hey, someone had to start. Someone found that Riot Games has trademarked, in August, they trademarked Riot Tabletop. What does that mean? Does that mean more board games are coming? Max vs. Minions was pretty neat, but is there more? Who knows? I don't know. But we can hope. And then on Board Game Geek, I found a geek list where someone talked about a year or so into the hobby, 10 lessons that I've learned. And just different things, which I thought was really interesting and some nice discussion there. If you have something you'd like me to showcase on this, just email me at tom at dicetower.com. If you want to see any of the things I just talked about, there's links in the description below. Let's move on. Lantern's version of Roll and Ride. Lantern's Dice, an easy and quick to play, has similar feel to Lantern's and I'll show you why I like Lantern's Dice better. Coming up! Hi, it's Stella from Maple University. In Lantern's Dice, each round an active player rolls four dice. Each player then uses the color of that die on that quadrant and mark area on the player board corresponding to that color. There are bonuses you gain from marking certain areas on your board. A lot of points coming from marking several areas to make a certain shape so you can get the same shaped tiles from common area. 
these worth a few points. They are coins that you can collect. This is good to mitigate the roll. Each game randomly dealt three cards with special power. You can spend the coins and do this special power to help you achieving your goals. You are usually torn between wanting to mark the areas to get your bonus or complete certain areas to get your bonus point tiles. This makes interesting gameplay. You want to probably strike a good balance for this. So, lanterns dice are like more than lanterns. I would have mentioned this before for someone like me that has some issue with imagining rotation in my mind. Lanterns dice is easier to do. I can just grab the tiles if I want and rotate to see what area I still need to mark to get the tiles. While in lanterns, the rotation is harder to imagine because you get to keep adding each individual tiles uh, with the different orientation. Nothing's wrong with the game, but it's not something that I can do very well. Well, thanks for watching. We are Meeple University on YouTube. See you next time. <laughs>
Hi, we're Board Game Opinions. I'm Steve. I'm Amy. I'm Mark. And I'm Jonathan. And we're back with another picture quiz. We're varying it a bit this uh, this time. The pictures will be face up, which they haven't been before. And this time I'm going to ask for which of the five pictures here, board game related possibly, is the odd one out and what the connection to the other four is. Uh, so what, what connection the other four have that the fifth one doesn't. Uh, so we're going to see how they do. They're going to call me back when they think they've got an answer or they're ready to pass. Um, and we'll see uh, whether you get this at home as well. All right, go for it. Uh, oh, dice in a circle. Is that trois? Yeah. Oh, okay. Next one. Let's go for this one. Ta da! Oh, it's upside down. Here we go. Carcassonne. Oh, He's all trapped. <laughs> I see a link. Da da da! That is. La Havre? Yes, it's the Uber Rosenberg. That's right, La Havre. Da da da! -da. That is the new one. Newton, Newton that's right. Mm -hmm. mm. And the last one. Ta da! Um, um, thingy Majigan. Um, Castle of Burgundy. Castle that's right, Castle of Burgundy. Yeah. Well, Trois and Carcassonne are both French. Yes. Kind of. La Havre? La Havre is French. Yes. Yes. <laughs> well, um, Castle of Burgundy? Is, I'm assuming Burgundy. Bel Burgundy. Belgian, isn't it? Is it? La Havre? Is it in French? That's France. France. Okay. <laughs> it's the <Right>. harbour. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's French. I just thought the city was in no, it's, Belgium, it's, but if it's in France, that's great. And the castles of Burgundy, the original game's De Burgundy von, von Burgundy. Burgundy start. <laughs> yes. But at but least the places. We think the castles of Burgundy are actually in France. I'm not sure about that. I I'm, don't know. That's, that I'm not I I'm think that's a bit of a stretch. But they are places. It, uh, Newton was obviously we, we, British. Yes. So that's, that's not yes. French. So I'm thinking they're all French, yeah. except for this one. Or if we're not that, those are places, and that isn't. Yeah. All right, should we go with that? Oh, what's the connection? Just that they're places. They're all places except for this, which is a person. Okay. Yeah. All right, Steve. Uh, so, what's your connection then? They're all places except for this, which, which one is a person. Uh, I will give that. So they're all places in France, but they're more specifically they're all places in Europe, and this is a person in Newton, uh, which is a fantastic game if you haven't played it. Um, so they got that right. We're probably going to have another one in the future, so hopefully look forward to seeing you then. Uh, bye. 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 What's up, everyone? My name is Melissa McKeck, and this is Smashing Buttons and Slamming Cards. This is a segment where I talk about a video game I love and connect it to a board game I love. And this week, I want to talk about Player Unknown's Battlegrounds for the PC, Xbox, PlayStation, and even mobile devices. It is also called PUBG. PUBG is a battle royale style game where you drop from an airplane onto a map and you're trying to loot as much as possible and as quickly as possible. That way you can use that loot to eliminate other players from the game. And the last person standing wins. I would like to connect that to... Survive! Escape from Atlantis. This board game also has that survival sort of battle royale kind of feel to it where you have a bunch of different meeples on uh, the island of Atlantis and each meeple has a differing amount of treasure that they have claimed. And the object of the game is to get as many of your meeples off the island as quickly as possible because the island is sinking and you want to get them to a safe island. And you're, it's got to take that style element to it where, uh, again, you're trying to eliminate other people's meeples off of the island. So it's got that same sort of battle royale flair that PUBG's got, and I love both games. Survive's got that wacky feel to it, and it, it's just a lot of fun. So that's it for this week. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next week. Hey folks, let's take a break here from Board Game Breakfast and talk to Mike Malconian. Welcome to the show, sir. Hey Tom, nice to meet you. Yeah, yeah. So this is really interesting. You have a game on Kickstarter right now called Dance Card. Yeah. I got to be honest, I'm not really much of a dancer. I've always been told to stop. <laughs> uh, yeah. What, what is this game about? Well, I'll be honest with you, neither am I, um, and the game is actually, the setting of it is a high school dance, and I, if I'm being honest with you, I've never been to any of my own high school dances, so that's fine, Super because awkward. I've also never uh, slayed any dragons or summoned Cthulhu either, and I love those games. That's true. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, so uh, yeah, the point of the game is it's, it's called Dance Card. It's set during a high school dance. Every character or every player gets a character card. I'll show you an example of one here just so you have an idea. In the upper right-hand corner, you have your character. And uh, upper left-hand corner, I should say. And it shows you, you know, your uh, relationship to all the other characters. There's like your friends and different people on here. And uh, the reason that's important is it'll show on your card your three dance partners. And the whole goal of the game is to move around the board, the dance floor, and dance with your three dance partners. Very straightforward, very easy to grasp concept. Where the gameplay comes in, where the strategy part of it comes in is... Just like in high school, you have all these different relationships with people. You have your friends. Everybody had their clique in high school. So your friends can give you bonuses when you try to go for dance roles. You have a rival who you're trying to avoid because you don't want you know that person to put you in a bad mood and they'll you know add bad dice to your role. Um, you want to avoid the chaperones because chaperones are downers. Nobody wants to dance in front of their teacher. All kinds of other stuff. You can go chat with the friends of your partner and they can give you advice on like, oh, you know, you want to dance with so-and-so, my friend so-and-so? Okay, well, do this and it'll impress them more. Now you have a bonus to your dance. So even though it's a very family-friendly concept, a very kind of vibrant, peppy kind of um, uh, theme, the gameplay actually has a lot of tactical play to it. And once you kind of understand the mechanics a little bit, you can start to like build up combos and really build up good dice pools and, and the dances are resolved by dice um the, the, the reference i give people is it's kind of like elder sign if you've played that where there's icons and numbers and you're trying to like meet the requirements it's kind of like that not exactly but kind of like that uh, but based around the theme of uh, a high school dance well one of the things that i find interesting about this game is the artwork is very vibrant and you know yeah. really jumps out at you who, who did the artwork uh, actually, a lot of people did the artwork uh, from all over the world. I have people in Mongolia doing the coloring. I had someone in the UK doing the penciling. I have a, a graphic designer who's in South Africa. So it was really like a worldwide effort to, to bring this game to life. And you're right. The vibrant artwork is one of the things that really got people's attention. Um, the artwork actually is a byproduct of the community itself. There is a community that's very interested in this game that I've kind of built up on Facebook over the last year or two. And... Uh, when I used to get new pieces of artwork, I would run it through the community. I'd put it up and say, hey, what do you guys think of this? Should we change that? You know, Should this dress be red or purple or whatever? And the community got very involved in trying to help design these characters and the way they look. Um, so a lot of the artwork in the game actually is designed by the players, by the fans who've been following the development of this game, which is something I'm proud of because uh, it kind of gives them a sense of ownership on it. And once the Kickstarter went up, you know, they were eager to back it because a lot of their own opinions and stuff had gone into the game. Um, well, let me ask the you reason, about that. Then. Yeah, you mentioned ahead. you have this uh, community of fans. How, how did you grow this? It's not like you have like a backlog of games that people know no. already. Yeah, no, it's actually happened very organically. What happened was maybe two years ago or so when I first started um, just trying to show the prototype to people, all the artwork in the game was just kind of hand-drawn or I was using like stock photos or whatever. So it was getting to the point where I wanted to start actually creating real characters. So I had a few very um, like prototype-style artwork. I didn't have anything final that was done. And I posted that on Facebook in different kind of groups uh, like the Board Game Group or Board Game Revolution, places like that. And people started commenting and saying, oh, I really like this character. This character looks like my kid or you should put this kind of outfit on them or whatever. This kid looks like a punk kid or a goth kid or whatever. Everyone started commenting on it and bringing their own experiences to it. And um, so every time I put up a picture on somewhere, there would be all there'd be like 50 comments of people commenting. And I said, OK, why don't I – instead of you know clogging up these other Facebook groups, why don't I invite these people to a separate Facebook group, which ended up becoming the Dance Card uh, Facebook group. And we can just – all of us kind of congregate here and talk about the game and, and talk about the artwork. And that community has just grown and grown and grown uh, in the last couple of years. Of uh, people who are just very interested in this game because it does, you know, scratch a certain itch. You know, I'm, uh, I think having a very contemporary, vibrant setting that people can relate to, people whose kids can relate to. You know, a lot of my friends, and I'm sure it's true for you too. A lot of my gamer friends, their parents, they themselves are people who are like in their 30s or 40s or whatever, and they have kids who they would like to bring into the hobby, who they want to teach, you know, the hobby to. But the, there's not a lot of themes that like necessarily speak to their kids' life experience. And one of the things I've noticed is I've had a lot of parents telling me, "Oh, this is a great game to play with my kids." Like, you know, they really dig it. They think these kids, they look like the friends at their high school. These kids look like, you know, people they see every day. And that's meant a lot to me because, um, you know, we all love games, but we also need to bring new people into the hobby. And I feel like this game, with its theme, can kind of bring those people in. So so this is, it's interesting. You're talking about this game. You're, you're crowdfunding it right now on Kickstarter. But yeah. you also kind of crowdfunded the background, the 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 world building in a, in a sense. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, 
So one of the things that a lot of people comment about this game is that they like is the diversity of characters. Part of that was definitely just practical. Um, there's a huge cast of characters in the game. It's like 32 characters that are all out on the board at the same time. There's like 32 standees on the board. Um, they couldn't all look the same because then you right. wouldn't be able to find them, right? It would take forever. So from a mechanical um, necessity, from a practical necessity, all the characters have to look very different. Well, that would resulted in having characters who were obviously different genders, different you know ethnic backgrounds, all this kind of stuff. And when people saw that, they were drawn to it because they started seeing you know, themselves represented in the game. And that also helped build this audience who wanted to contribute to it and comment on it. You know, we have a character who's a, of a Hawaiian background that was made purely because one of the people in our community is a teacher. And he said he had a student who was a, a Hawaiian uh, a student and he had like a ukulele he would play and kind of serenade the girls and stuff. And now there's a character in the game who does that, who looks like that. Um, so, and there's a character, you know, for example, there was another character who is in a wheelchair because um, someone who was in the community said, you know, I know people who have who are in wheelchairs who go to dances all the time, but they don't get represented as going to dances because people don't think of people in wheelchairs going to dances, but they do. So why don't you put a character like that? So we have a character who's in a wheelchair in, in the game. And just by adding those things, I feel like we brought a lot of people into it who maybe wouldn't have given it a second look. But because there is such a diversity to the cast and something that everyone can kind of relate to, it brought these people to it. And I'm very proud of that. So last question here then, you said you didn't go to any of your high school dances, then what made you pick this theme? You know, sometimes you, the, the theme, you don't pick the theme, the theme picks, picks you, right? Probably like a lot of games, you designed the games, a lot of people who design games, you know, you probably get like a thousand ideas a day, and a lot of them probably don't go anywhere, right? Sometimes the right mechanic and the right theme just come together, right? So I was just, you know, going about my day one day, and I thought, oh, well, let's think of, a, what's an idea for a game? Um, well, a dance works, because a dance needs a dance floor, okay, the dance floor is the board, okay, so what's your objective? What are you trying to do? You're trying to dance with people, okay, so you have your friends in high school who can help you out, um, what are some like challenges you can run into? Oh, well, in high school, everybody had bullies they were trying to avoid or you know, teachers they were trying to avoid. Okay, there you go. So the mechanics and the theme just kind of matched up really well. You know, um, you know, you have to, you know, you need cards that represent different abilities that make you do better in the game. Okay, well, those will be uh, dance moves, right? Everything mechanically and thematically just kind of came together. So I don't personally, it's funny because people always talk to me about dancing. Now everyone's like, oh, like let's talk about dancing. Or you know, give me dance gifts and memes and stuff. The truth is I don't really know much about dancing or, or, or even like personally dance very much but the theme and the mechanics just came, just came together so that's the game I ended up making so it picked me I didn't pick it <laughs> alrighty folks well, that's dance card if you want to see uh, the Kickstarter itself check the description of the video below and you'll see a link for it there thanks so much for coming on Mike thanks Tom so what's being added to the dice tower this week well a second copy of Tapestry it's certainly a hot game Las Vegas Royale, really cool version of that. Ascension, Skull and Sails, I think I'm gonna keep that one separate from the other Ascensions. Then we have the Lost Expedition, in which I'll be including the expansion. High Society, great card game. Barrage, of course people are excited about that one. And even though I wasn't a big fan, I know a lot of people like Days of Wonder games, so Deep Blue. From Peterson Games, The Gigantic God's War. And then for our kids library, we have Go Nuts for Donuts, Master Fox, Monster Flush, Kung Fu Zoo, Dr. Microbe, Dr. Beaker, Dr. Eureka, and Medici. Just kidding, that's for the regular Dice Tower Library. That's what we added to the library this week. Everybody. Today I'm going to be testing my dice. That is testing the balance of my dice. I play a lot of D&D and whether you know much about this game or not, you probably know that rolling dice is a huge part of this game. So I have a couple sets of dice. One of my dice is extremely lucky and I kind of feel guilty when I use it because I think that it might be weighted to the 20. I'm here to share with you this test and to settle things once and for all whether I have a unbalanced dice or not. If you would like to try this test on your own, all you need is a glass, water, and salt. A crazy amount of salt, that is. Enough so that your dice will become buoyant. Kind of twirl your dice in the water and see which side it tends to come up to every time you twirl it. 
the dice that is blue is weighted for uh, the one side. The brown dice is the dice that I've used the longest and felt that I was pretty confident it was balanced because I sometimes will get a 20 or a higher number, but it kind of tends to be in the middle. And the black dice that I talked about was my lucky dice. After the test, though, it actually is very balanced and it comes up random. My lucky dice is just lucky, I guess. My brown dice, which I relied on for accuracy, is actually kind of weighted towards the middle, which is why I rarely would get 20s or 1s. But when you don't ever get 20s, that's kind of boring, so I think I'm going to be playing with my lucky black dice from now on. I hope you guys enjoyed this little experiment, and um, thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower. I hope you guys have a lovely day. Good morning, everybody. My name is Aaron from the Board Game Brothers, and welcome to another episode of Mystery Component Monday, a segment where I show you a picture of a game piece, and it's up to you to try to guess what game that piece comes from. So, let's put on our thinking caps, because here is this week's picture. Okay, time's up, pencils down, and thinking caps off. Now, the answer to this week's question is... Tiny... Epic Quest. Tiny Epic Quest is a movement selection, dice rolling, push your luck game that introduces item meeples, which are meeples that actually are able to equip and hold items. The game is played over five rounds, with each round being split into two phases, the day phase and the night phase. During the day phase, players control three meeple adventurers that can be moved to different areas of the overworld map by means of one of five different types of movement cards. During the day, players can visit magical mushroom grottos that grant powerful bonus effects and can also accomplish quests that offer a reward to players who complete them. During the night phase, players will roll dice to be able to fight goblins, learn magic, and explore dungeons to hopefully find magical weapons and artifacts that will grant them powerful new abilities. But they must beware, if they push themselves too far and get too greedy, they may be defeated and be forced to be sent back to their castle. Tiny Epic Quest is a game that, for all intents and purposes, is like playing The Legend of Zelda in board game form. The box may be tiny, but the venture will definitely be epic. And that's this week's game. Congratulations to everybody who got it right, and for everybody else, there's always next week. But until then, I hope you all have a happy breakfast. Hi, everybody. Hello, it is Ryan and Bethany. From Ryan and Bethany Board Game Reviews. All right, today we're going to be talking about Aquasphere. This is from Stefan Feld and Tasty Minstrel Games. But before we do, let's bridge the gap between health and board games. All right, so one of my biggest struggles this week has been uh, using the vending machine as my lunch solution. So uh, I need to start planning ahead better, bringing lunches to work. Maybe that's something that might work for you, too. Save a couple bucks and eat healthier. Uh, speaking of planning ahead, when you plan ahead, you set yourself up for success. I have been bringing my work bag or my gym bag to work almost every day for the past three weeks, fully intending on running and I'm not doing it about 60% of the time, but I did today and it's because I brought it. I gave myself the opportunity to succeed and I did, but enough about that. Let's talk about Aquasphere. All right, so speaking of planning ahead, <laughs> this is a Stefan Veld game. Uh, very tight actions, uh, very few uh, opportunities to, to take those actions, so you have to plan ahead really well. Uh, and I love that about this game. Very tense, very tight. Speaking of planning ahead, you can plan ahead and expect us to tie. <laughs> we played this game the best three times. We have either tied... I think we tied two of them. And we and tied in the tiebreaker. <laughs> <laughs> and I won that one. Yes, you did. You, there's another <laughs> tiebreaker. But what I like about that is that there's many paths. You kind of, in, in a game like this, you have to, you can't abandon any one area, but you can still focus on different things. And those games where we tied, we are both focusing on different things, but we are still able to accumulate the same scores. All right, so this is a game we really love. Hopefully you will give it a shot. Uh, but remember, you can check out our full review at Ryan and Bethany Board Game Reviews. You can find us on YouTube and on Facebook. All right, well, this is Ryan and I'm Bethany, encouraging you to play games, live healthy, and create moments. Bye, guys. Bye, everyone. I've said many times that the Dice Tower is not all about Tom Vassell. I mean... 
there's not much I can do about being the face of the Dice Tower other than just not doing videos for a year, I suppose. But yeah, I did start it, and I did most of the reviews and started the podcast and all that at the beginning. But as time has gone by, I am trying to constantly be bringing more and more folks into the Dice Tower. I consider myself to be a host at the Dice Tower. At the different Dice Tower conventions, I try to be a host at those conventions. If I'm, if you're watching my show, I am trying to be a host to you. There's a little bit of an entertainer mixed in there, but at the same time, I'm a host. Uh, I want you to have a good time. And I love that people at my house or run a party at my church or something like that where I'm the host. I don't necessarily have to play the games as long as everyone else is having a great time. I don't necessarily have to be, you know, enjoying the food as long as you are enjoying the food that I put together for when you come. And I've seen, you know, uh, the because I have very strong opinions and because I'm a moron sometimes, uh, people will say Tom Vassell is arrogant and, you know, he thinks everything revolves around him. Well, you know, I, I, it, it probably does come across that way and I, and I never mean it to be so. At the same time, I'm certainly willing to be out there. Have you ever been in a situation where no one wants to say anything? Some people don't have that problem with that, you know, introverts, right? The extroverts like myself are like, I wish someone would say something. So if no one else will, I will, right? And that's the way we are sometimes. And it can come across as, doesn't he love to hear himself speak? Well, I can promise you that's not the case because I try not to listen to my own shows. But I understand the sentiment there. And recently I read a, a thread about Tom Vassell, <laughs> how arrogant we were again. And someone had mentioned that I had come up and joked with them at a convention and that I just, it seemed like the convention was all about me. And, you know, I thought about this. So I thought, you know, because I try to be introspective about these things. And all the time, you know, when people said, you know, what you said there got me upset and you're thinking, well, it was just a joke or whatever it might be. I try to think about it from the different points of view. You, you, you can never please everybody, but you know, it wouldn't hurt to please a few people, right? So like if you came to Dice Tower Con last year, I stood at the front door because I wanted to greet people as they come in. So I'm looking at that, that as, hey, you're here, welcome, glad you're here, trying to make people feel welcome. I turn around, look at the person coming in going, oh, there's Tom, look at me, I'm here, welcome to my show. And I thought, man, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to be over the top friendly and not make that look like I'm trying to look at me, look at me, look at me. Because there is a fine line between that, right? The fine line of the, ooh, ooh, pick me teacher so that everyone can see the right answer I got. And the person who's just excited to share. So there is a fine line between that. I think at the end of the day, I'm gonna err on that side because I want people to have a good time. When I go to conventions now, it seems like each convention that I run, Dice Tower conventions, retreats, crews, etc., I don't play as many games. I just try to run around and talk to people, not so everyone can see me, but that everyone will have a good time. You know, I, 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 this was when we talked about Dice Tower East and I said one of the things was, I talked about this as I was talking about the change and I said, you know, I, w I know that some people came to the Dice Tower convention, didn't even see the host of the Dice Tower, and that seems kind of weird, and someone said, yeah, you think we come just to see you. No, I, I don't, but I also want you to feel welcome. You know, it's like a restaurant when the manager comes by your table. I was just at a restaurant a few weeks ago, and the survey said, did a manager come by your table? They didn't, and I thought, well, is it that big of a deal? But when the manager does come by your table, you're like, oh, wow, they really care about us. I mean, maybe they do, maybe they don't. But that's the way I am. I'm not trying to make the Dice Tower all about Tom Vassell. I really am not. I really want to promote the other people. I do my best to put them up in the shows. You'll, as, as, as the years go by, hopefully you'll see more and more people who are elevated, who get to come up and become a quote unquote star or something to that degree. And I, I hope that's where people see that. And again, I can see it around the other way. And of course, if it ever comes across that way, personally, email me at Tom at Dicetower.com. I do like to talk about these things. Um, but now you're saying, isn't it ironic? You're talking about yourself in this very segment. Fine. Let's move on. Happy breakfast, everybody from Singapore. But what I'm actually going to talk to you about is love letter that I've been taking around Nepal and Singapore uh, for a couple of days. Uh, so this worked really well in Nepal because 
I was carrying it uh, in a backpack, uh, so it had to be really small. And I've got the new version, the 2018, 2019 English version, which comes in like a, a small cloth bag rather than the box, which makes it ideal, uh, ideally portable. Now, it's also got a couple of new roles. So it's got the spy and the chancellor. And having played the old versions, going back to the old one, uh, the, I'd miss those roles, or at least I'd miss the spy role, which uh, is a nice, fun way to get an extra point in the round. Um, also, the victory point tokens, the favour tokens you're going for. The new ones are sort of plastic discs. Uh, they're much better than the old red cubes. Uh, artwork's a little bit different, but otherwise, you're not looking at that too much. Uh, it's a great game to teach new people. I've played it with, uh, with someone from uh, Germany, a couple of people from Germany, and they loved the game. Um, and uh, a lot of people from uh, England or Scotland, uh, everyone's got the game and have really enjoyed it. Now, it is the sort of game that the first time they play, if they've not played in a sort of a game like it, ten different cards, it puts them off a little bit. But as soon as they're around in, they can see why it's a great game and love playing it. And sort of the banter starts rolling with, oh, do you have the princess? Both when you're playing and after, which was ideal for sort of hiking and trekking and going around at sort of a fabulous country, uh, there being that extra sort of layer of fun with the group. Anyway, that's Love Letter. Highly recommend it. And I'm Oliver Reist, signing out. That's it for another Board Game Breakfast. Check out our contest, of course, that you've seen there. Thanks to all the contributors for doing a great job, as always. I appreciate you coming on board. And thanks to our East registration, eight days away. Folks, there's all kinds of ways that you can be involved in the Dice Tower. Come on and join us in our live shows. You know, if you ever want to be more involved in Dice Tower, let us know. Of course, you know, I, it's always good if you come to me and say, this is what I'm interested in doing. I have people say, I'll do something. I'm like, well, I, I don't know quite what to do. But either way, you guys are the best. We really appreciate you watching. I, re I try to read every comment on every video um, to see what people are thinking, to see what people are saying. We want to make our show better. We're striving to constantly improve. Hopefully you can see that as time goes by. I hope that all of you who got the rewards from our Kickstarter, I hope you enjoy them. And I want to thank you once again for sponsoring our show. Until next time, this has been Tom Basil, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production. Sponsored by Cool Stuff Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at CoolStuffInc.com.